I'm going to keep on kind of with what the direction I was going in this morning, uh, dealing with salvation um, and all the ins and outs and the ups and downs and whys and wherefores of salvation. Um, and I want to keep it simple because I do believe in the simplicity in Christ, uh, which is one of the things the Apostle Paul he warned us about it in 2 Corinthians 11. And he said, you know, bear with me a little my folly, for I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy. Because somebody's going to come, they're going to preach a different Jesus, and they're going to try to remove you from the simplicity of the gospel, the simplicity that is in Jesus Christ. If salvation was easy enough for me to understand at nine years old and I and I will I will never forget that night as long as I live it was Dennis Teague preaching at Bible camp and they gave an invitation and I just knew that I wanted to be saved I did not want to go to hell and uh, I don't remember what all the whoever whatever preacher it was that's not really important because the preacher doesn't save you it's the word of god that saves you but he went through i believe the romans road of salvation in a bible at king james and laid it out for me asked me if i believed that yes and um, if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness you believe that yes and i remember praying tears in my eyes Asking Jesus to save my soul. And uh, so if it's easy enough and simple enough for a child to understand, then it's simple. And that's what Jesus was telling the disciples when all the children came up to him. And they, the disciples were going, this is an important man, stay away from him. And he said, no, 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 for as such is the kingdom of heaven. You don't know what you're doing. And uh, so I'm going to try to keep it simple to understand about salvation, what it is, why do we need it? And I would say that out of everything that there is in the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, the one thing that we need without, if we get nothing else out of the Word of God, we need salvation. We need to be saved because when we die, we are going to face judgment. God's judgment and if we're not ready to face that judgment if we do not have our sins forgiven the consequences are more than we can bear I don't want to spend eternity burning forever and ever and ever I do not want that so uh, in fact let's do this Turn to Isaiah, chapter 66. Isaiah. This is sort of the, the preface of the message tonight, the continuation of what I was saying this morning. Isaiah 66, the last chapter of the book of Isaiah, verse 22. For as the new moon, as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worms shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh and that I believe is describing the lake of fire that's going to burn forever turn to Matthew 25 Matthew chapter 25 or actually yeah Matthew 25 Jesus is saying that the kingdom of heaven shall be like a shepherd when the Lord comes in his kingdom uh, he says in verse 31, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory, and before Him shall be gathered all nations, and He shall separate them one from another, as the shepherd divideth the sheep from his goat. Even though He's gathering all nations together, 
He's not going to divide them based upon their nation. That, to me, that's important. I think in this world it's very important. Because you do, we, you'd be surprised. When we went down for Uncle Harry's funeral, we went down Highway 65 to Conway, got on 40 and went up to Jacksonville. And on the way back, coming up through the Arkansas Ozarks, I mean, there's churches everywhere. There's great big billboard advertising a radio station. Um, and I'm going to try to remember the name of it. But it was a white supremacist radio station. In northwest Arkansas, the KKK, the Christian Identity Movement, they're all located in northwest Arkansas. I mean, they're thick as dog's hair there. And they have a whole radio station, that's a white power radio station. And I've read some of their doctrinal statements. Some of the statements from these churches, they're very bold. They, they say only Anglo, only white Anglos can go to heaven. They're the real Jews. Nobody else, because they are not of the race of Israel, they cannot go to heaven. Very bold about it. Very brash about it. But Jesus here does not separate the nations based upon their nationality, their ethnicity. He divides them as sheep and goats based upon what they did or didn't do. And he says, uh, toward the end, he says in um, verse 45, Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you did not, uh, did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment. The punishment is everlasting. It does not stop. It's like the whipping from hell. If you want to put it that way. The whipping from hell. It's the one that never stops. It just keeps going and going and going. You will be punished forever. You will feel the agony, the torment. Turn to Luke 16. Luke chapter 16. This, um, Luke 16 is the second, I think, the second sermon I ever preached in my life was Luke 16. Um, this is the rich man in Lazarus. In verse 22. It says it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in what? Torment. The Jehovah's Witness, the Mormons, maybe even some other groups, I don't know, will tell you that hell is annihilation, that when you, hell is the grave. When you go there, you're annihilated. Your soul is annihilated. You have no, no consciousness of anything. And I'm going... Shoot, if that's, if that's it, why can't I go sin? Why can't I go and do whatever I want to do without giving obeisance to some God somewhere? If all that's going to happen to me when I die is that I'm going to be obliterated and I'm not going to have any knowledge of anything after that, then why don't I just live however I want to if there's not going to be any punishment? But there is going to be punishment. This rich man lifted up his eyes. He was being tormented by the pain that he was in. And it was a knowing, conscious presence. He was aware of his surroundings. He knew that he was in hell. He knew that he wanted water to cool his tongue. And when he found out, he couldn't get any. By the way... He's still there. 2,000 years later, Gary, he's still there wanting that drop of water to cool his tongue. He's not going to get it, and he's never going to get it. Now, even if we're just totally wrong, and there is no God, there is no heaven, and there's no hell, 
You can't blame the Christian for trying to live a moral life. There's nothing wrong with how we live. But if, it, if what we're saying is true, a lot of people are going to suffer an agonizing eternity in hell. And accepting the offer of a loving God is the easiest thing in the world to do. All you have to do is let go of your pride. That's all you have to do is let go of your pride. So that's, that's what we're going to be... Uh, turn to Revelation 20. Verse 11. I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. There was found no place for them. You can hide, you can run, but you're not going to hide from God. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. God has an angel writing down every sin you commit. Those, it's just like any earthly courtroom. Those are charges that are laid against you and you must answer for those charges. Who was telling me about somebody that had, in my office that had Melissa that was, that was telling me about a, a movie that was rented by a family member and they put a charge against a certain woman for embezzlement, felony embezzlement for not returning a movie. And she said, I never even rented it. It was a family member. Okay? Well, there's a statute of limitations. There has to be on something like that. There's a statute of limitations on that. But on the sins that you committed, there is none. You, and you say, well, I was, you know, I was 14. I, I didn't... Surely God forgot about that. That was a long time ago. It's still written there. And God didn't forget about it. And you're going to have to answer for it. Okay? So those, that's what we need saved from. Amen? Uh, I went over this this morning, what salvation is not. It's not church membership. It's not given or administered by an earthly organization. It's not, it's, you do not gain it by reciting a catechism. You do not gain it by water baptism of any kind. You cannot buy it. The way Catholics believe you can buy indulgences, you cannot purchase it, you cannot wear a cross that's been blessed by a pope, and that gives you absolution from all sins when you die. There's none of that. It is not an excuse or a license to sin without repercussions. It is not an automatic healing of all diseases or instantaneous wealth. Salvation has nothing to do with that. Salvation has everything to do with where your soul is going to spend eternity. And even though you are guilty before God, you can have those sins remitted and forgiven. And God sees you as being guiltless standing before him in his courtroom. I, I, I read through this this morning, administered by God, not man. The salvation comes by God through Jesus Christ and he is the only way. And then we get into the definition of what salvation is. Romans 5, 8, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, much more than being now justified by his blood. Justification means it would be like if a, a court charged you with a crime that you knew you did not commit. And so you got a lawyer and they presented a case, they, they proved your alibi, they proved your whereabouts, they proved that you had no motive, they proved in every way possible that there was no way in the world that you committed this crime, and the jury found you not guilty, you are now justified in your plea saying, I'm not guilty, and the jury has found you not guilty, therefore the court says you're not guilty of this crime. But in God's court system, 
All of us are guilty. That's the difference. Everybody that goes into God's courtroom is guilty. Everybody is. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The only way to be justified is by salvation, by the acceptance of God's grace and His offer of salvation to you that you accept the blood to blot out the transgressions and the sins that are against you that the angels wrote down, those now will be blotted out by the blood of Jesus Christ and you are now justified freely in the presence of God and it's as if you never did anything wrong. You are, you are as innocent now as the man in that situation I gave earlier. You are as innocent now as he is even though you know you did it, you're, you're now innocent. God takes the sin and removes it away from you. Justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by, his, by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Now, um, Hebrews 2. In fact, let me, yeah, let's do this. Hebrews chapter 2, turn there. God's defining what salvation is all about. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 2. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, we covered that this morning, but remember this. As I said earlier, every thought, every deed, Everything you did from a child on up through the rest of your life, everything that you did, knowing the difference between right and wrong, was written down by an angel. And according to God, that deserves punishment. And that's what he's saying here. Uh, every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by them that heard them? Now I'm going to use this verse again a little bit later uh, in a different, sort of a different understanding of salvation. In Psalm 18, let me read through some of these. Here's, some of the, here's a list of things we're being saved from. Psalm 18, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. What is your enemies? Well, number one, it's the one you're looking at in the mirror. You are your own worst nightmare. Your flesh is your enemy. The lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Those are your enemies. They are the ones chasing you down to destroy you. And God says, I can save you. So what that means is, and we know this from the Bible, is that when we die and we receive the resurrection body, it will not have a tendency toward sin. We will no longer lust. We will no longer be full of pride. Our eyes won't latch on something. But boy, look at his mansion compared to mine. I think I want his mansion. We won't, we won't have any of that. Amen, Gary. Praise God for that. None of that stupid stuff. The, Paul talked, called it the sin that which does so easily beset us. How easily does the devil trick us into sin? Easily. Okay. Psalm 34, 6. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him. Saved him out of all of his troubles. And I believe that God can save you out of troubling situations that your sin got you into. God can even rescue you from those earthly consequences as well. Now, he doesn't have to. And I would say that if, I, if you were to give me a choice of God saving me from earthly consequences or heavenly or eternal consequences, I'd choose the eternal ones. Easily choose the eternal ones. But there are times when God can save from both. He can save him out of all of his trouble. 
Certainly, God can work in you a new man in you that does not want to go out partying, getting drunk, and all the things you used to do all the time before you got saved. God can remove that from you, and that saves you from a life of future trouble. The day the alcoholic stops drinking is the day his life starts getting better. Am I right? The day the drug abuser stops abusing drugs is the day that his life starts getting better. And on and on and on and on. Psalm 106.10, And he saved them from the hand of him that hated them and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. God can make the people who were your enemies your friends. I mentioned Mike Hutzel this morning and it's true. I remember my mom in, said, uh, won't you come? Uh, our church and I were having a revival. A guy named Mike Hutzel's preaching. And I didn't know who Mike Hutzel was, but I went and listened to him. And I didn't care much for him. And he had heard about me. He didn't care much for me. But God turned that around when I um, started studying this Bible, and studying the King James and looking at different things. I wrote a little book called The King James Code by Divine Order. And I went down to Charlie Miller's church down in, um, oh, it's down in the lead belt somewhere. You remember where he used to pastor down there? Huh? In Parkview. And Charlie wanted me to come down and do some things on the King James and Bible numbers and everything like that. And I did that. And Mike Hudson was supposed to be there preaching revival that week. And so I left a copy of that book with Brother Charlie for Mike Hutzel. Mike Hutzel read that and he called me like two days later and he said, I know a guy down in Arkansas that is going to have a camp meeting this, this year and I can get you in down there. And that was Lonnie Burks. That's the first time I ever went to Harrison. But Mike knew that God had worked something in me. And now when I looked at Mike, I wasn't like, oh, you legalist, you King James people, you make me mad. God had made even my enemies my friends. God will do that. Amen? Is it better to have friends or enemies? Friends. Amen. Okay. Um, Psalm 107, 13. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. The word stress is in there. Jesus said, I've come to give you life and that you might have it more abundantly. Now, you're never, ever, ever in this world going to have a stress-free life. It's never going to happen. But now you have somebody to go to when you are under stress. You can go to the Lord. Isaiah 45, 17, But Israel shall be saved in the Lord with an everlasting salvation. Ye shall not be ashamed nor confounded world without end. So think about this. 10,000 years from now, all of us are going to be in heaven. Is somebody during that time in heaven going to take the Lord's name in vain and say, I don't, I don't like this place anymore? Is somebody going to do that? No. Because salvation lasts forever. There is absolutely no way, no how, that once we get there, that any of us are going to turn our backs on God. We're going to have a new body. It won't, it won't want to sin. It will be perfect in every way. We'll be like the angels of heaven. We'll just, it'll just be sinless perfection for all of eternity. Amen. Better than bacon. <laughs> Amen. Way better than bacon. Now, this, I don't know what point this is. Uh, that's salvation. This is point, I don't know, three or four. Salvation is only by grace through faith. Only. Period. The end. Ephesians 2. Turn there. Turn there. Only. And I'll, I'll, I've said this before and I'm going to say it again. 
If you ever want to feel like you need to recognize a false gospel, ask the question, does it have a work or a performance attached to it? To the extent that it does, it is a false gospel. If it requires, let's say we've, we've got former Catholics here. And the Catholics, who was, who would, raise your hand if you were saved in some other place other than a church. Okay. Is that even possible? Huh? You hope, yeah. According to Catholicism, Every Catholic church, I don't know if you know this or not, even the round ones, every Catholic church has a spot on the floor. It, they look like a cross. There's a line that goes this way and a line that goes this way. And where they meet in that spot right there, that's where the casket will be in a Catholic mass funeral. That's where the married couple will be. That's where you will receive the Eucharist. It's done in that spot right there. And you can't receive that anywhere else, any, anywhere, outside of that spot right there. I even found out in my study that, that I did on the Catholic Eucharist, uh, I'm done with those videos, that the Catholic Doctrine basically says that in order for there to be a celebration of the Mass, there has to be a crucifix present. There cannot be a Mass celebration where they turn the wafer into the physical flesh and blood of Christ without a, an idol or a statue of Jesus hanging on the cross. It's, it's not... You can't, you can't go out in the woods and have it done. You, nowhere. There has to be a crucifix in that spot. That's what makes it. And that's the, exactly what the Jerusalem Council said. Don't eat that. So anyway, it's by grace through faith. When, whenever they add a particular work or deed or performance or payment or a continuing of deeds and so on, then you have a false gospel. Ephesians 2.8 For by grace are you saved through faith. And I could end it right there. And that not of yourselves. You cannot save yourself. Can't do it. It is the gift of God. Meaning that it is 100% totally unmerited. Just as a loving father or mother will give unmerited gifts to their children. Like an unmerited supper. An unmerited breakfast. Ah, an unmerited bed to sleep in. Why are they doing that? Love. Love. You do good things for your children because you love them so much. And so you'll work, you'll sacrifice, you'll labor, you'll clean up, you get mad at them. You might whoop them every now and then, but then it's over with, you're done, you love them all over again like they've never done anything wrong before. That's grace. That's what it is. It is the gift of God. It is not of works lest any man should boast, and I have never seen, I've never seen a situation where somebody added a work to salvation that they didn't boast about. They always, always, always. The se I got, somebody sent me some Seventh-day Adventist junk in the mail the other day. And it took me a while to figure out that that's where it came from. And I just, who, listen, I love you. If you send it to me, I'm just telling you, I threw it in the trash. I don't go for that junk. I don't buy into that stuff. Don't tell me that I have the mark of the beast on me because I'm going to church on Sunday. You have got a works-based salvation given to you 
by a false prophetess named Ellen White who received it from an angel from heaven. And what did Paul say? It's cursed. And I've had people call me on the phone. Boy, you seem to be so knowledgeable about the Bible and prophecy. How come you go to church on Sunday? You can show me in the law anywhere where it says I have to go to church on Saturday and I'm only confined to going to church on Saturday. I'll gladly oblige, but I'm sorry, but it's not in there. And they have added a work to salvation. It is a false gospel and it's cursed. And they boast about it. They boast about it. We, we keep the Sabbath, bless God. All them heathens that go to church on Sunday, well, they don't. They always boast about what their works. But let me ask a question. Do you think it's possible that a Seventh-day Adventist can lust after a woman on the Sabbath day while they're at church? You think that's possible? So let's, let's see if we get this straight. They go to church on Saturday in order to supposedly keep the law. And yet they're lusting after somebody at church while they're keeping the law. So what has that done to their law keeping? God says it's gone. All your works of righteousness are gone in the day you transgress. So anyway, that's what they do. For we are His workmanship. Bless God, I go to church on Sunday. I go to church every Sunday. No, you don't. God brings you to church every Sunday. You are God's workmanship. And every good thing that comes out of you came from God through you. Don't boast on the things you did that were right because that wasn't you. That was God's workmanship in you we are his workmanship created in christ jesus unto good works which god hath before ordained that we should walk in them titus 2 11, for the grace of god that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men what does the grace of god do bring salvation it is by grace period through faith Period. And I've read enough of Catholic doctrine to tell you that they think that we have got it all wrong and all messed up because we believe in grace alone through faith alone. I'm telling you, they've got it messed up when they tell you that Christ, yes, Christ died for your sins, but not all of them. Should not you be punished for some of your sins? So you must pray. And I want to ask the question, when did prayer become a punishment? Because that's what they do to you, right, Joe? If you go in the confessional and you tell that priest your sins. Yeah. Right, Chris? They're telling you that prayer is punishment. That's wicked. Prayer's not punishment for me. Prayer's like, God, will you please listen? I'm glad I have you to talk to. Nobody else listens to me. Amen? See, you didn't listen then. Anyway. Uh, Romans 3, 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But notice that verse is not done. Being justified, how much? Freely. By his grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. See, there's grace and faith. They're in the same place, isn't it? Grace and faith. So the grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Just believe. Believe him. Thief on the cross has got his arms tied, got his legs tied. What can he do? Nothing. Can he be saved? He is. And he's in heaven 
waiting for us right now. We're going to meet him one of these days. Amen? Because Jesus had mercy on him on the cross when he couldn't do anything for Christ. But he serves as a perpetual testimony of salvation by grace through faith. He believed that Jesus was going to rise from the dead before he even died. I love that story. Let's stand and be dismissed.